thanks for coming. Uh, I'm Bill Brown with Brookings Mountain West, and we have another great lecture for you tonight. Uh, just a few of my usual housekeeping details. Our next lecture will actually be a week from tonight. Uh, Adele Morris from the Economic Studies Program at Brookings will be out to join us. She'll be talking about the UX, US tax system and where we go from here. So if you have the stomach for that, we really would love to see you out here. <laughs> uh, Tonight, uh, oh, I have one more announcement. In my hand, I'm proud to have a, a new publication by Brookings Mountain West with the Brookings Press called America's New Swing Region. It's a series of essays uh, from uh, political and, and demographic scholars in the region uh, that have taken a look at our Intermountain West region and its growth, both population-wise, its economy, its growing significance in national politics, the Electoral College and uh, Congress, and I recommend it to you highly. We have some uh, information sheets on it on the way out if you want to pick that up. And now let me get uh, to the business at hand, which is to introduce Peter Singer, who's back out here from Brookings Institution. Peter's a senior fellow in the Foreign Policy Program and director of Brookings 21st Century Defense Initiative. You may know Peter from his writings, uh, both scholarly and popular, his op-eds and editorials. He's a familiar face on national TV and radio. You may have heard him today on KNPR, give you, giving folks a little taste of what he's gonna talk about tonight. Uh, he's an expert on military technology and, and military policy. And as you can see by our chart here, he's gonna talk about facing the new reality, trends shaping the future battlefield. Peter, there you all you are. Thank you. It's really neat of uh, you all to come out today. So at Brookings, I lead the part of the program that works on um, trends that are reshaping war, issues like uh, changing actors in war, changing technologies, changing expectations. Now, this challenge of predicting what comes next is something um, that we have to be very modest about because uh, typically um, in history we get this wrong. My favorite example actually comes from a um, New York Times article on October 9th, 1903. And in that article, the New York Times predicted that, quote, the flying machine, which might really fly, might be evolved by the combined and continuous efforts of mathematicians and mechanicians in from one to 10 million years from now. <laughs> that same day in October is the very day that two brothers in Dayton, Ohio started to assemble the very first real flying machine. Now, rather than throwing our hands up in the air and saying, you know, we can't do this, we're just not good at predicting what to come next, um, I would argue that the future uh, is not inherently unpredictable. It's that while we can't predict specific events with any kind of confidence, we can note key changes that are happening. That is, while none of us will know exactly what the future world will be, I think we can identify some, though not all, of the key forces today that might shape that future world. I'll give you a metaphor that explains how I think about this. Imagine a tea kettle filled with water. Now with all of our modern science right now, we simply cannot predict where one molecule of water will be next within that tea kettle. But we can, for example, note that if that tea kettle is on top of the stove, that heat is a key force in shaping the future of the water in it. That ultimately that heat will turn molecules in it from water into steam. Now again, we have to be very modest about it. We can't, for example, um, predict that there might not be a, what I call asteroid effects, that say a five-year-old might come along and knock that tea kettle over. We can't predict those kind of things. We can just note the key forces, the trends that are shaping that world with that tea kettle. And it, the way to think about this is that trends are guides, nothing more, nothing less. But these macro guides are important to listen to. As John Naisbitt once put it, quote, Trends, like horses, are easier to ride in the direction that they're going. Okay, so what then are some of the key trends that are shaping the future battlefield that we have to take into account today? The first of these trends is um, 
the budget battlefield, the finances that underlie the U.S. military, but the broader national economy around it. America faces, in um, the words of everyone from the president to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, a national security crisis when it comes to our economic security situation. As you can see here, our U.S. debt stands um, at roughly $15 trillion. You can see um, how good a job we're doing in the below chart at budgeting right now. Essentially, we keep going deeper and deeper into deficit side. Now, this figure is all the more alarming to note where it stands in comparison to our gross domestic um, uh, product. Essentially, if we don't take action to rein this in, very soon we will be at um, where Greece stands. That is, we're going from a roughly 100% debt to GDP ratio right now, headed towards 300%. Now, there's a lot of different ways to think about this. These charts um, numbers, I think, disguise some of the reality. So the way I come at it is I go, OK, our debt stands at $15 trillion right now as a nation. What could we buy with that debt? Well, one thing we could buy for $15 trillion is 30 new deals or 15 Marshall plans. Another way to think about it is we could pay the military budgets for all of NATO, including the US, for the next 15 years for the amount that we owe in debt. We could pay the rent for every single American renter, apartment renter, for the next 45 years. Or we could pay off the mortgage for every single American homeowner for the next 17 and a half years. But we're Americans. What would we do if we actually got back that $15, $15 trillion in debt? Well, we'd likely go on vacation for the next 165 weeks. That's what we could buy with our national debt right now. Now, the good news is that we're finally starting to face up to this challenge. We used to always say, well, that's a situation to deal with in the long run. We don't have to care about it right now. Well, now we're finally starting to realize that we can't just keep pushing it off into the long run. It's hitting us. The problem, though, is how we're going about it, budget cuts. Um, Essentially, in the debt ceiling deal this summer, we are, uh, our leaders agreed to cut approximately $500 billion from the national security budget. And um, like it or not, and to be clear, I'm not in the happy camp on this, uh, that train has already left the station. And the next part of the deal entails that if Congress doesn't come to um, a agreement, uh, we'll cut another $500 billion over the next two years in national security funding. What that means is that there is a slim thread uh, that stands between that. And that thread is the idea that Congress will show the maturity and ability to compromise and approve a reform package that focuses on the actual drivers of our national debt and deficit, which is both needed entitlement and needed tax reform. Unfortunately, that idea of Congress and maturity and ability to compromise really isn't something that uh, I believe we can, we can predict will happen. So the basic point that I'm making here is that you can see the historic pattern that the defense budget for the U.S. has gone in. And you can see in those colored lines sort of the different directions that might happen depending on the current budget situation and in the um, uh, final one in there in red, what will happen if they go through it with uh, the meat acts of sequestration. Now, what's interesting is it simply takes us back to the average of where we've been historically. That doesn't seem that big a deal. The challenge and why it'll feel more painful is this chart, the percentage that it stands of national GDP. But there's a bigger thing here. Go back to those numbers, 15 trillion versus a predicted, all those charts that showed you was 1 trillion. What I'm getting at here is that we have a national political climate right now that's assuming that these cuts that are playing out right now won't be something that we talk about in 2013 or 2014 or 2015. That's the reality here, that the discourse over the defense budget and national security in general is not going to be the kind of growth that we've seen over the last um, decade. It's going to be a narrative around cuts, regardless of who becomes president or not whether it's on the right or the left. 
Now, there's a number of implications that I think we're going to see come out of this. One is that within the military, we're going to see a much greater emphasis on figuring out how to upgrade current systems versus replacing them like we've done in the past. We're going to see more examples like the B-52. This is a bomber that first flew in 1952 that's still being used today. But I'm not talking about longevity of military technologies. I'm talking about upgrades that revolutionize the platforms. So the B-52 was a plane designed back in 1952 to fly higher and faster than Soviet interceptors to carry out a strategic bombing run during the Cold War that never happened. Today, that same plane, over 50 years old, is being used for close air support in Afghanistan. So revolutionizing how we use technology. Another example is um, interoperability and how we look at foreign partners and allies. Uh, this um, is a picture of, well, let's pose the question. Is this a picture of the HMS Queen Elizabeth, the new Royal Navy aircraft carrier under construction? Or is this a picture of the Richelieu, the new French Navy aircraft carrier under construction? Or does it even matter if the plan of those two navies is to jointly man it, where you may have British jets flying off of a French carrier or vice versa? What I'm getting at here is because of their defense budget crunch, Britain and France have figured out how to pool resources. Is it so, so beyond the pale that maybe the US and Britain might start to think about this, or allies like the US and Australia? Once forbidden concepts are really going to start to be um, opened up. Similarly, we're going to see more of this, a much greater emphasis of COTS, civilian off-the-shelf technology. That is, a um, driver that's going on in the defense um, industry right now is not how do you develop new military-only technology, but how do you take technology on the civilian side and bring it over to the military side? And that means, though, you've got to figure out how do we incorporate this technology into secure battlefield networks. But as much as the bean counters want, the budget's only one trend. The economic situation's only one trend that's going to shape war. A second big trend is illustrated by this chart here. This is a visualization of Moore's law, the fast pace of technology, the idea that we've been able to pack more and more computing power into our microchips, our computers, our robots, such that they basically double in their power and capacity just about every 18 months. Now, there's a better illustration I can give you of what Moore's law means in the battlefield. And it's this. This is a picture of a Hallmark greeting card. How many of you have ever, ever held one of those Hallmark greeting cards in your hand that opens up and plays a little song? If you've ever held one of those cards that opens up and plays a little song, you held more computing power than the entire US Army had when my father served in it. That's the impact of Moore's law on the battlefield. So what happens moving forward? Well, if Moore's law holds true within the next 25 years, which is the planning horizon that we um, work with within the Pentagon, our technologies, our microchips, our computers and the like, will be a billion times more powerful than today. Now, I don't mean a billion in kind of the amorphous way people throw that around. I mean literally multiply their current power with a one and nine zeros behind it. That's if Moore's law holds true. Now, Moore's law doesn't have to hold true. It's not a law of physics. It's just a law of history. It's held true for the last 40 years, but it doesn't have to hold true for the next 25 years. So what if, for example, technology moves at a pace that's one one thousandth as it has historically? Well, that means that our technology within 25 years will be just drop those last three zeros. It'll be just a million times more powerful than today. That's the impact of the fast pace of technology. And so this idea of how do we adjust to new technologies in war seems really new, but actually there's historic parallels for it. Um, I think the best analog for where we're at today is a lot like the situation around World War I with technology. So prior to World War I, you had a series of technologies that were once science fiction, and then they became real, and then they had to figure out how to use them in war and all the implications that came from them. One example was um, something that H.G. Wells, in a fiction stor short story, called a land ironclad. Winston Churchill read the story of land ironclads, 
said, this would be really useful in our battles against the Germans in these trench warfare that we have, but we can't let the Germans know what we're building. Land ironclad, if that's easy to figure out, so we'll call it something different. We'll call it a water tank carrier as a way to keep the secret. And you get the tank. Now what's interesting, and it shows the sort of the complications of what this means to a military, that is a picture of a young officer who joined West Point intending to become horse cavalry. He was actually one of America's greatest horsemen in history. He actually represented the United States in horsemanship at the 1912 Olympics. But he moved into armor. That's a picture of a young George S. Patton. Similar other examples that we have of these uh, technologies around World War I were um, things like the flying machine. Now the first person to conceptualize the use of a military aeroplane was actually A.A. A. Milne. Who was A.A. A. Milne the um, inventor of besides this concept? Winnie the Pooh. The guy who came up with Winnie the Pooh also first to come up with military use of aeroplanes. And then soon you get Army West Point recruiting cadets by saying, you can fly in planes. This is before the Air Force even exists. Another example, the atomic bomb conceived of by H.G. Wells that directly influences the real world physicists who later um, work in the Manhattan Project. Now, I did a book and I, and I talked um, here last year about one of these new technologies that's coming along that may have a parallel effect, robotics, where for example, our forces went into Iraq uh, with a handful of drones in the air and zero ground robots. And now today the US military has over 7,000 aerial robots and over 12,000 ground robots. But what comes next? What are other examples? This is a um, world cloud uh, from a series of interviews that we've been doing with scientists, heads of military labs, futurists, people who work in the investor side of the venture capital community, basically the kind of people that make tomorrow come true. And we ask them, well, what, are you, what do you think are technologies that are like where, say, the Predator drone was back in 1995. And there's a word cloud of some of the technologies that they mention, that they see as being the next big thing. Um, to pull out some of the examples, uh, armed autonomous robotics. Artificial intelligence this is a picture of Watson, uh, the computer that won on Jeopardy. Now the key here is not just smarter AI, but AI across the system. AI being used in everything from sensors to let you, um, a camera for example that just doesn't take pictures but actually understands what it's taking pictures of to the back end using um, analytics to make sense of all that data that's out there. To um, proliferation of uh, IEDs but smart IEDs. That is, the IED has been one of those um, dangerous technologies out there that's killed uh, and wounded more American soldiers than any other technology in Iraq and Afghanistan. And yet the IED itself is not new. It was actually first used um, uh, as far back as our American Civil War. The new version of it, the new version that proved so deadly to our up-armored Humvees and the like, called the EFP, that was actually first used in the 1940s. What's happening now, though, is this old technology is starting to be made smart, starting to get up and move, incorporate GPS, et cetera. Nanotechnology, shrinking things down to the atomic scale. Directed energy, lasers becoming real. Material science changing, or what we call 3D printing. This um, picture right here is, I think, a good illustration of some of the game-changing effects. That is a picture of a, um, a plane that was conceived of by a group of um, British professors and graduate students at the University of Southampton. They got together and they said, wouldn't it be neat if we could build our own drone? They conceived it, they designed it in a computer, and then they manufactured it over the course of one week. That is, it went from idea in their head to plane flying in one week through 3D printing technology. Compare that to, for example, the F-35 program, the new military jet that was conceived of in 1997 and still isn't yet serving in the US military. 
space weaponry, neuroscience breakthroughs, human enhancements, basically the kind of stuff that we visualize from movies like um, Iron Man and Captain America, biotech, even genetic weaponry. Moore's Law seemed really impressive, the idea of technology doubling upon itself, of microchips doubling upon itself every 18 months or so. What's happened in the bio side is not that every 18 months or so doubling, but actually a 400% rate of growth on an annual basis in terms of new breakthroughs. So it's moving faster than IT is. Okay, but this leads to trend number three. Um, it's not the technology itself not these killer apps that may change things, it's all the implications they have on the world beyond. So for example, why has the growth of unmanned systems like the Predator been important? Well, in some ways um, it uh, changes on everything from military organization, who can do what, what within the military, to doctrine, how do you use these weapons, to issues of combat stress. We have a situation where, for example, the burnout rate of pilots within these units, even though they're not physically in the battle space, is actually higher than it is for some units physically in the battle space. To big political questions, like, for example, are we at war in Pakistan right now or not? Well, this technology has enabled us to carry out more than 300 airstrikes there, but we haven't declared war. It's an interesting dilemma for democracy. Um, but just as it was for the land ironclad back in the day, you get from the period of first using it in war, in World War I, to the what comes next, the experimentation side, the figuring out how to use it. So for example, this is a picture from what were called the Louisiana Maneuvers. And these were basically the US Army training exercises after World War I, where they essentially concluded that, hey, mechanized troops work better than troops on horseback. And of course, this question of what happens next and how do you succeed in it um, isn't just about what you do, it's also about keeping your eye on what other people do. So this is a picture of a um, Chinese counter-terrorist team that's mounted on specially outfitted segways. Now, I don't show you this picture because I think it's all that great an idea, but I um, point to, again, parallels of watching others, learning from each other. So the Germans, for example, in the interwar period in the 1920s and 30s, they had not been the first users of the tank. They had not invented it. They actually had very few tanks. But they watched what the British had done with the tank during World War I. They also watched some of the British war games with them in the early 1920s. And they studied and they learned. And they created something that they called the Blitzkrieg. They figured out how to use the tank better than the people who had first invented it, all because they learned. This leads to the fourth big trend that matters as a shaping exercise. Basically, um, where we fight, not just how we fight or who fights, but where we fight. That is, when people try and predict where the next war is, they look at a map and they try and find the next hotspots. Is it gonna be North Korea? Is it gonna be Iran? What's gonna be the next place that we fight? But there's a bigger change going on right now in war and the wear of war. That is, for most of human history, mankind basically fought in two places. We fought on top of the land, and we fought on top of the sea. And then our science fiction-like technologies came along around the turn of the last century, and they allowed us to fight in entirely new places, under the sea and in the air. And we created forces around fighting there. And those capabilities then, of course, created all sorts of new interesting questions. Like, for example, the ability to fight in the air changed our definition of the home front. You could actually reach beyond the battle line and strike cities behind it. And that, of course, raised all sorts of interesting legal and ethical questions. Well, we have similar parallels today in terms of technology opening up new domains. This is a picture of a place that didn't exist a generation ago. It's a world of zeros and ones that technology has created. And it's a world, of course, that's crucial 
to everything from commerce to conflict. The importance of cyberspace to our entire global pattern of life is just almost impossible to um, overestimate. There's some four billion people behind roughly 50 billion devices that have connected to the internet. Uh, everything from how we book our airline tickets to how the Pentagon plans its operations all depend on this domain, this new place called cyberspace. Imagine your day without a computer. Imagine the Pentagon's day without a computer. Imagine an Al-Qaeda terrorist day without a computer. They can't conceive of that kind of thing anymore. But just as the utility of cyberspace has grown, so too have the threats within it and to it. Um, each day, for example, there are roughly 55,000 new pieces of what we call malware created. And these pieces of malware are not um, inc designed increasingly by humans, but go back to what I was talking about before, it's now AI programs that are building new weaponry within cyberspace. To, we have some 200,000 computers each and every day that are turned into what we call zombies. Not you know things from um, Walking Dead, uh, a TV series that started out great that's gotten pretty bad. But um, more importantly, these are computers that have essentially been compromised by someone else. There's more than 200,000 computers that are compromised each and every day. But more important than these numbers is the changes in the threat landscape. Essentially, we've seen a shift from hackers, basically individuals, mostly interested in attention of some sort, to organized entities, often linked to governments, but also um, transnational criminal groups, that are more about espionage and broader political and economic efforts. Last year, we had a good illustration of this that was revealed, something called Operation Shady Rat. And this, is, um, this chart shows you everyone that was targeted by this operation. Uh, 72 different governmental agencies at the international, national, state, and local level to a variety of corporations and everything from aerospace to oil, natural gas, to solar energy, to a variety of um, non-governmental agencies that ranged from think tanks that you might be familiar with to the international um, doping agency uh, that was, for whatever reason, targeted right before the 2008 um, Olympics in Beijing. I was at Lockheed Martin uh, a couple um, uh, months ago, and they talked about how they felt themselves they, they now were aware of at least 30 different of these types of campaigns going after them. Organized efforts targeting what we call advanced persistent threat campaigns. And that's the ones that we know about, all going after trying to steal secrets from this one company. Now, this issue is um, raising all sorts of new questions and complications that will, of, co of course, shape politics and war moving forward. If we're going to see more action in this new place called cyberspace, well, what's the best way to organize yourself, to train and equip to fight in this? What's the division between the military role and the civilian role? Who should be doing what in it? To also, how do we watch out for threat hyping? That is, we have a pattern to be aware of where when a new threat comes along, we sometimes get excited about it, maybe too excited about it. Oops. So um, malware, for example, in Washington, D.C., has been described as, quote, like a WMD, that's by the head of the Senate Armed Services Committee, able to, quote, destroy our society, that's by the National Security Advisor, meaning it should be looked at as a, quote, existential threat, that's the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Now, call me crazy, but I reserve the term existential threat for things like alien attack or thermonuclear war. I don't include malware, computer viruses that as of yet have not killed a single person as an existential threat. That is one of my concerns is that we see um, people saying, well, this is the new Cold War. But 
the parallel may not be the Cold War that we think of, but actually that period in the Cold War in the late 1940s and early 50s, where we actually took seriously real world people that later became the inspiration for Dr. Strangelove. And where you actually saw crazy ideas implemented, like for example, um, the Army created what they called the Pentomic Division. It was an Army ground tactical unit that planned to use nuclear weapons close up on the battlefield. Even the idea of having like a nuclear bazooka where the soldiers would just duck and cover when the bomb went off. That's the parallel right now we have to worry about of sort of hysteria crossing with technologic ignorance. Okay, but um, just as the locale of the battlefield is shifting in, in new domains, it's still another part that's playing out. War is something about humans. Um, war is a human endeavor, and of course, uh, hum uh, wars happen where the people are. And so we're seeing shifts in that that matter. Um, one is this notion of counterinsurgency. Whether you're talking about US military strategy at the high level all the way down to the training that young US Army captains get, we've seen an emphasis in recent years on how do we navigate uh, complex geographic social patterns of simultaneously defeating a guerrilla army while winning tribal elders, hearts and minds in rural mountainous regions. That's the counterinsurgency fights of today. But what if something else is going on? What if while we're training and equipping ourselves to fight in villages that are exactly the same as when Alexander the Great fought in those same villages, the rest of the world is moving in a different direction. That is, what if instead of its rural history, humanity is becoming more and more urban? In 1800, only 3% of the world's population lived in a city. In 2008, it crossed the 50% mark. Within 25 years, it'll be somewhere around the 75 to 80% mark. But as we add 3 billion new souls to the world, roughly 99% of them in the developing world, we're seeing changes happen. Um, it's not just urbanization, it's uh, moved towards what we call mega cities, cities of more than 10 million in population. 50 years ago, there were only two of them. New York, Newark, and the Tokyo era. We've since added more than 30, almost all within the developing world, and over the next 25 years, we're gonna add at least 30 more of these mega cities. But more importantly, the kind of city and its look and its feel is changing. The city is no longer defined by its glittering skyscraper. The thing that all these mega cities share is this picture. We call them by different names. We call them the ghettos, the slums, the favelas, the shanty towns. But basically what we're seeing is that cities are where the angry losers of globalization are gathered. The disconnected are gathering in one place. And so what that means for conflict is that we're seeing a shift. Conflict, insurgency, used to start in the rural area and then move into the city. Now we're seeing rebellion start in the city because that's where the anger is. That's where militant groups and terrorist groups find it easiest to recruit. It's also the turf that they know well. That is, Sherwood Forest is not out in the hinterlands now. Sherwood Forest is Gaza City, Grozny, Mogadishu, Karachi, um, Rio de Janeiro, whatever you name it. And finally, the city is where professional military forces don't do well Go back to those illustrations that I gave you, and so that's why these groups want to fight there. And so um, we're seeing a lot of different implications of this for what it means for the military of the future. Big, large platforms like that right there are going to find it really tough to navigate an urban environment. That's the Marines canceled expeditionary fighting vehicle program. A, um, uh, basically, it's the size of a city bus, which you know, makes great, great sense if you have big, wide open streets like uh, Las Vegas. But again, most of these cities are the shanty towns that this wouldn't be able to move through. Or um, other questions. This is, um, shows uh, US troops in Afghanistan. And they're working on uh, pulling out an IED. There's a great new technology that our counter IED program has invented. It's a standoff metal detector so that these troops won't have to do that, won't have to stand on top of it. Instead, it will allow them to detect a single piece of metal from 100 feet away. Great improvement for these guys out there in a dirt road in Afghanistan. 
it would be useless in an urban environment. Because imagine having a system that tells you in an urban environment where a piece of metal is 100 feet around you. Soldiers are going to toss that in a second. And this leads to the final trend that's shaping everything, who those soldiers are. Essentially, um, in this future world, youth will dominate, and particularly a generation that we call the millennials, those who were born from 1980 to 2005. They're important in a lot of different ways. One is just their raw numbers. There are roughly 1.4 millennials for every member of the baby boomer generation, but for Generation X, for every one Gen Xer, there's three millennials. So just in raw numbers, they matter. But it's also more important the kind of expectations and thoughts and experiences they bring to bear. So for example, I was working on a war game with the US Marines, and I had to pull the red flag at one moment because the war game was set in 2025, and the Marines were very excited about the idea that all of these future Marines would have things like iPhones and tablet computers. And I was like, no, in 2025, the 18-year-old Marine and the 18-year-old insurgent they might fight will have both been born the very same year that the iPhone was born. So that they're going to look like a, at an iPhone the way I, for example, look at one of those digital punch calculators. I'm, they're going to see it as old school to different um, political understandings and the like. Uh, for example, we conducted a survey of more than 1,000 of these millennials and found very different attitudes. Uh, as you see in this chart here as an um, illustration, they are far more isolationist than prior generations. They have double the level of isolationism, for example, of prior um, generation. It comes out of having very different historic experiences. The impact of um, 9-11, Iraq, and Katrina has created this isolationist mentality. They also admire very different types of leaders, particularly team builder type leaders. They think differently. Um, they come at things with what we call a Google mindset. Um, essentially, we grew up in a world where information was given to us by some authority figure, and we accepted it, and then usually we hoarded that information. I knew the answer on a test, and so therefore I was better than my competitors in class. Or in a bureaucracy, I had the information, so I don't share it with those in other divisions of my corporation or other parts of the Pentagon. A Google mindset, information isn't validated because some authority figure gives it to you. Information is validated from the crowd, and therefore it's only valuable if you share it. It's a very different approach. Um, multitasking. Uh, they are very adept at working at multiple problems at once. I was out at a U.S. Air Force base where I sat behind one young airman who on his computer had 36 different chat rooms open. Each one of those chat rooms was an air combat mission that he was coordinating. He was handling it all at one time. But the trade-off of this is um, strategic deficit or uh, what the, um, the, the formal term for it is called partial attention deficit syndrome. The best illustration of it is um, the talking to your kids when they're also texting underneath the dinner table. They're having both conversations at once, but they're having less rich conversations in both part. With you, it's uh-huh, yes, no. With their friend, it's why, no, OMG. We're seeing very different expectations of technology, particularly the idea of um, it being seamless and incorporated onto your body and even in your body, and constant uh, ubiquity of data, putting it together. This is, for example, a picture of a new device called UP, which you'll wear like one of those Lance Armstrong um, rubber bands around your hand, but it will do things like monitor how many steps you take in the day to track your calorie intake, to it will monitor how your hand shakes while you sleep to wake you up at the optimal time in your REM cycle and then it will share all that information online via your iPhone to very different memories, different um, concepts of memories, not just historic memories, but a way different way of looking at it. This is a picture of the very first hard drive in history. Um, it was amazing, an IBM model that came out in 1956. It could data transfer 8,000 characters per second. And IBM leased this hard drive 
for accounting purposes for the equivalent of $20,000 an hour. Corporations would bring it in for $20,000 an hour to utilize. Of course, it was so big they had to move it on an airplane. Today, I have an iPhone that um, holds 6,000 times as much memory. But again, it's not just how much memory I might have on my iPhone or my son's iPad, but the meaning of the very word memory. Is memory something that you cart around with you? Or is it something that's up there, out there in the cloud? Or notions of security. Um, secure mobile is the big area that things are going in in the IT world. But what does mobile mean? Mobile once meant something like this. This is one of the um, first uh, mobile communications networks uh, with technology that the US Army had. Basically, a um, mobile phone was a phone hooked up to a donkey. Then mobile phones got more sophisticated. We put them in cars. Then suddenly, teenagers could carry them, like Zach there. Now we carry them on our body are increasingly in your body. That one in the bottom left there um, is a, it's like a digital tattoo device. Similar, what does secure mean? This is a picture, one of the first pictures of the Facebook. What does it mean, um, what does security mean in a world where, for example, you have analysts joining the National Security Agency right now who grew up in a world where they constantly controlled how much they shared of themselves online. They modulated it. And they're joining an agency that's in charge of cybersecurity, but assumes that all of its own networks are compromised. That is, security used to be having a wall, no longer. OK, I'm going to end here um, by just bottom lining these five trends for you. I've seemingly talked about the future, but notice how I kept making historic parallels. And that's because, in my mind, the best way for us to succeed as individuals, as organizations, but most importantly as a nation, is to keep our eyes on both horizons. That is, we need to keep one eye on the horizon coming at us, the future, so that we're better able to identify the changes looming and thus better shape our responses to them. To, as Martin Luther King once put it, bend the arc of history. You can't fight it, but you might be able to bend it in directions that are um, important. But we also need to keep our other eye on the horizon behind us to be able to draw lessons from the past, to know that, as Mark Twain once put it, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. Thank you. So we, we've got some time for um, questions, comments. We certainly love to hear from you. So just uh, pre, please raise your hand. I'll call on you. And if you could identify yourself, right here in the front. Student. My name is Alex Velto. Uh, you mentioned how we have to navigate with tribal elders in a place like Yemen, where the countryside is so dominated by uh, those tribal leaders. Uh, what is the process for like, information gathering to ensure our drone strikes there are effective? Well, I, I, was, I was pointing to the example of uh, Afghanistan and counterinsurgency, for example, there. But um, we're starting to carry out those strikes equally across the border into Pakistan to places like Yemen and the like. Uh, the challenge, as you're putting your finger on, is distinguishing between what kind of information you can collect from afar via technology with what kind of information can you gather on the ground, what we call human intelligence, and then also trying to incorporate um, cultural understanding into that intelligence. And that's where I think the US has probably had the biggest challenge, is hitting all three. Um, we have very, very sophisticated systems right now. Um, as an illustration, the sensor on um, one of the newer model uh, unmanned aerial systems, the camera can detect a disruption in the dirt from a mile overhead identify that that disruption in the dirt is something that we humans call a footprint, and then without any human interface, backtrack that footprint to where it originated. So for example, if that is an insurgent or a would-be terrorist, um, this is the house that they came from. Amazing. But it can't, for example, tell you, is this house they came from a tribal elder's house? And um, at the same time, what is in his heart and mind? 
Is he, for example, someone like the tribal elders in uh, the, um, what we call the Sunni Triangle in um, uh, Iraq, who had been part of the insurgency, but grew increasingly frustrated with how Al-Qaeda was very wanton with violence in their villages, and so literally on a dime shifted from supporting the insurgency to actually fighting against the insurgents, which is the true story of how the surge in Iraq worked. That kind of understanding didn't happen from technology from afar. It happened actually from um, special operations teams, and particularly SEALs, meeting face-to-face, -face, sharing tea with these tribal elders. And then at one key moment, basically a tribal elder told them, tomorrow I'm going to be out on the streets with 50 of my armed guys. I know we were shooting at you last week. Don't shoot at us tomorrow because we're going to be doing something you like. And the SEALs decided to trust them. And what they did is on that day, they turned on their Al-Qaeda allies. That balancing act is really, really difficult. And it's something that um, we're, right now, with our systems, not that great at. We're getting better and better the longer we are operating in places like Afghanistan. But again, I would argue that it's almost like a wasting asset, because I don't see us ourselves, um, I don't see, go back to the political figures, I don't see, for example, um, the US public uh, wanting to support that kind of long, enduring commitment. And we're seeing how the narrative around the Afghan campaign is shifting. Yeah, right there. I have a law student at Boyd here. Um, last month, I this month I attended a conference where they talked about technology and how regulatory frameworks have been slowing technology down, except in the area of computing, because that has a lack of regulatory framework on that. I just want to know if you comment, do you think that the regulatory frameworks are, because this is almost the opposite of what I saw, this almost seems like technology is booming, and their argument was technology was actually slowing down. So do you have a comment on that? Uh, I'll just speak to the fields that I know. Within robotics, uh, no regulatory is not slowing it down at all. Actually, it's the opposite, where the technology is accelerating well past it. Um, just as an illustration and, and, a, and a, a, a great example of the complexities that come out of this, we have this wide variety of unmanned aerial systems used on the military side. And the only kind of legislation that um, really shapes it on the domestic side is new legislation where basically Congress ordered the FAA, hey, by 2015, figure out how to open up the national airspace to unmanned aerial systems. For the robotics industry, that will be akin to what the internet did for desktop computers, opening it up to a wide set of users who will range from the public to the private sector. Everything from law enforcement agencies. Uh, one company, for example, talked about how, look, we've got one client. It's the US military. It's a great client to have. We first, they make drones. They foresee themselves after this legislation adding as many as 21,000 new clients, because that's how many state and local agencies are that either can't afford aviation departments in the police or can't afford them, you know, have police helicopters, but they're really, really expensive. Um, to civilian side usage, everything from aerial crop dusting with robotics, which is how they do it in Japan, to um, cargo delivery, firefighting, fisheries, um, you name it to, of course, uh, civil, um, uh, surveillance for um, profit, news media, to paparazzi, to potential criminal side. Um, in Taiwan uh, last year, for, uh, a group of thieves utilized tiny robotic helicopters with pinhole cameras to carry out a $4 million jewelry heist. OK, this massive boom. And yet the only legislation is basically FAA figure out how to make it so that they don't crash in the air. All the other issues that come out of that, for example, the privacy questions with um, the police usage or, or private sector usage, to issues like insurance claims. What happens when one of them crashes? Who's responsible? Like, none of that's been figured out. So I would argue that really in true cutting edge technology, the regulations aren't a limiter. The, the only one area where I think it, it's been a limiter um, has been uh, bio in areas like um, cloning and the like. It's been a limiter in the US. Of course, it's moved much faster in other countries. I'm not so disturbed by that, though. Um, right there, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. How long will it take before our enemies, terrorists, criminals, learn this predator type technology and start using it against us? Well, I just gave you one example of a criminal that already used it, not necessarily against us, but that person that lost $4 million worth of jewelry. Um, the same can be said, it's not a future case uh, on the terrorist side. We've seen interest already. Uh, in October, the FBI arrested a guy named um, Rodwan Ferdeus. He was an individual who um, got into terrorism, wanted to blow up the um, uh, uh, capital, uh, and um, went out and got a drone. Now, the media covered it and said um, he got a, a model plane. The plane, the model plane, was the size of a Volkswagen Bug. Not a teeny tiny model. Rodwan made one mistake, though. He asked a FBI informant, where do I get C4 explosives from? So we live in a world already right now, not off in the future, already right now, where the challenge for a would-be terrorist was not getting the drone, but getting the explosives, which is a technology that dates back to, you know, 1200 uh, in um, ancient China. And, and so that's the world we're in right now. And it will be, you know, this is part and parcel of the challenge. Um, I go back to the prior question. One of the issues of a new technology is um, protections and licensing. You know, when they invented the um, horseless carriage, they had to come up with this scheme of what we call driver's licenses. Who gets access to this technology and how do we regulate it? And very quickly with the horseless carriage, it was used not just by criminals for getaway cars, um, but also uh, for terrorism. The very first car bombs happened within a couple years after the invention of the horseless carriage. Same phenomenon will play out here. Um, we just have to recognize that these are some of the dangers. Now, when Iran got that drone that went down, that predator went down, I mean, what do, you, do you think they, they can learn pretty quickly our technology and then use it against us? Well, the interesting thing is Iran has already been flying unmanned aerial systems for more than five years. So uh, if the question was how to, you know, could Iran get uh, ro robotics in the air, well, they've already got it and they've already proliferated it. For example, Hezbollah, the um, militant group in Lebanon, got their drones from Iran and Hezbollah used them against Israel. The case that happened um, uh, earlier this year where um, one of our systems, it was an RQ-170, um, it was a, a jet, it was more advanced than a, the Predator. It was jet powered, pretty stealthy. Um, uh, where when we lost it over um, Iran and even though our president asked really nicely, they would not give it back. Um, there was, there was a concern about, okay, what, what happens? You know, will, will the secret get out? Will they be able to clone it? Um, I give kind of a double answer to it. Uh, Iran um, lacks most of the, the industrial capability and design capability to really replicate it. So it was more of a propaganda win for them than anything else. It changed the conversation that week from being about um, their nuclear research to being about our lost drone. But the um, uh, airline flights from Moscow and Beijing to Tehran were pretty full that week. That is, there are other countries that can do a better job at reverse engineering. But, even, but again, having your hands on a piece of machinery, even if parts of it are still working, is not the same as being able to clone it exactly. Um, really, the best parallel for what happened would be when um, Apple left one of its iPhones in a bar um, before it came out. It was embarrassing for Apple. It maybe gave some of their competitors a leg up and that they could see what the thing looked like. They could see some of the materials that it, that it could use. But it didn't mean that Apple was going to stop making or using the iPhone. And it didn't mean the competitors could create the same kind of functionality in an iPhone because any modern machinery depends on both hardware and software and it's very difficult to put those two together. Um, let's get someone in the other wedges and then we'll go back here. Anyone on this side? Okay, yeah. Actually, uh, yes, um, 
Now, one, um, how are these unmanned droids um, going to decipher between who is the enemy and who isn't? when it seems like it is such a, a mix when our own soldiers have trouble deciphering those. That's, I think you've hit it, that um, technology may be an enabler, but it isn't a silver bullet solution. Uh, some technology will allow you to do things like um, uh, detect explosive traces at a long distance. Um, or detect whether someone's carrying a weapon on their body or not. Um, so it will give you the ability to detect a threat in a way that you couldn't before. With unmanned systems, another benefit is that it may give you the luxury of time. They talk about this particularly with ground robotics, that um, if you're bursting into a room in a military situation, or police are also interested in this use, as a human, you have a, that amount of time to figure out, is that someone who's armed and a threat to me, or is that a kid waving a stick, or a kid waving a toy gun? You don't have very long, because you have this notion of, if I don't decide quick enough, they'll shoot me. With a robotic system, you may have time. You can send it in there, and you don't have to worry about you dying if you don't decide quick enough. The trade-off, though, of course, is that um, someone, uh, let's use an example of someone shoots a AK-47 um, in uh, an Afghan village. We've identified that that person has a weapon. We've identified that they've fired a rifle. Um, we have a, a, a sensor on a predator, for example, that can identify the heat off a gun barrel 30 minutes after they fired the weapon. It's an amazing technology, but it can't tell you why they fired the weapon or who they were. They fired the weapon because they were sniping at US soldiers. They fired the weapon because they were actually um, uh, chasing off thieves. But they fire the weapon because they were celebrating a wedding, and that's the, what people do over there. So technology can enable you to do certain things, but it doesn't solve all your problems. And what you particularly have to be mindful of is getting too much confidence, almost an irrational form of confidence, because it, you know, now I know this, I know this, this is a weapon that was fired, but not getting to the next part of it. Yeah. Also, um, just one last question. Um, I've, I've heard um, in the news recently that some of these, uh, these uh, droid technologies and companies that build these. Droids is, is you know, Star Wars. These are not the droids you're looking for. Um, we're but not I, there yet. But, uh, robotics and systems, systems, yeah. But I've heard that they're extending the, um, a number of these to include um, uh, checking the borders, looking um, between Mexico, and they're kind of expanding for other uses. But also, as you pointed out um, so clearly with our, with our debt um, and the question of where that's going, um, we may not be the, um, the best buyers for some of these technologies, <coughs> and what would what does that mean? When you say not the best buyers. Or we may not be able to fit the bill for some of these technologies. Well, um, there's a, look, you know, as I pointed out, you have an overall trend in the, in the military budget and the government budget, and um, the, the good days, uh, you know, are um, passing. We're now entering the lean period, and we're not gonna have as much to spend. On the other hand, we still are, the 800-pound gorilla. So um, essentially, if you look at every dollar that's spent in the world on the military, at one point, 52 cents out of every dollar was spent by the US military. Now we're down to, depending on who's doing the counting, somewhere between 48 to 46 cents. So it's lean times for us, but we still have this massive buying power. Um, and that, that means that um, I don't think we'll see anytime soon spending on this new technology end. Uh, all the trend lines show it growing. On the border side as well, it's not military usage down there, it's uh, Customs and Border Patrol, as well as interesting, interestingly enough, non-governmental actors, like for example, one of these border militias actually is flying <coughs> its own unmanned border patrol. That's the world we're in today. Yeah, right here. Thanks. Um, it, it feels like, I mean, the U.S. consistently pushes the envelope on new technologies, and yet then we say that we need to protect ourselves against other states developing them. 
Um, it seems like we're guided by the idea that if it can't be done, we should do it or build it, um, whether it's wise or not. And um, at the same time, it seems like all this military technology is horrific for civilians. You know, you go back hundreds of years, and it seems like every development in military technology is touted as to make things better for, for, for the soldier, but it's just consistently worse for, for most people. And so, like, where's the hope? Why, why, why do you feel motivated to help this along? Um, I, I'm curious about your motivation. And, like, do you feel safer, like, if face recognition technology is introduced in a widespread way? Mm -hmm. that, would, would you feel better about that? You know, and, like, and just the other example, I mean, all the worst trends of drones are coming into being. I mean, they're working on an autonomous drone nuclear capable bomber. I mean, there's no wisdom, it feels like, in this. And so, like, where is the hope and where's your motivation? I think you hit it it right with this notion that um, there's this constant myth that uh, technology will somehow make war, either it will end it or will make it cleaner, safer, um, somehow better. Uh, it, 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 the examples might date from, um, for example, in 1621, John Donne, the, the poet of No Man is an Island fame, um, argued that through the invention of cannon, greater expense of blood would be avoided, that cannon would somehow make war end. Then you get to, you know, Nobel, Arthur Nobel, dynamite, thought it would be good, didn't work out. The people who worked on the Manhattan Project, and we get this, this notion, and, and um, you ask, you know, my motivation, um, my motivation is to pop those bubbles on multiple sides, um, to try and inject some fact into the discourse um, of what's really happening and maybe I'm optimistic, but I believe that if we have a better sense of what's really happening, we can better respond to it in more thoughtful manners. Um, you know, go back to that illustration of the Cold War parallels. And the most dangerous period in the Cold War was the period of, you know, where I believe the early stages where people didn't understand the technology and didn't understand the implications that came out of it. And so when you saw everything from these notions of, hey, it would be a good idea to fight with nuclear weapons. And we had an active debate in um, the US, for example, um, in 1954 as to whether we should uh, nuke the Viet Cong to aid the French at Dien Bien Phu to um, the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. Basically, the closest we probably came to thermonuclear war was essentially because of miscalculation on both sides, misunderstanding. And um, my own sense, you know, where I try and come at this and the, and the notion of what a Brookings does is that you can better aid public policy by injecting research and fact into those discussions. And therefore, you equip policymakers and also the public to be able to weigh in in a more effective manner. Um, you, the, the, the mythology that often reigns. Yeah, it may be transparency, but it may be um, you know popping the 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 myth of mythology that often surrounds complex issues. Just, and not to grandstand, but Daniel Ellsberg pointed out that we thought that the Soviets had a thousand nuclear missiles, and they had four uh, at the time at, at one point. And um, I want to thank you for um, chapter twenty. I learned a lot. The ethics and that uh, I, I hope that people are pursuing your questions. Cool. Thank you. Looking at the future of, maybe you were just limiting the program tonight, but you didn't mention anything, for example, about global warming, climate change uh, in the southwest, for example, projected water shortages, which are really here now. And, uh, and you also spoke of the population like it, you know, it could expand indefinitely. We're going to add one over three billion people very quickly, um, and there seems to be a limit and I didn't hear any of these mentioned in your calculations. Just curious why. I try and stay within um, the future trends that we can reliably project and um, essentially within a generation. 
I, I, I sort of, I, you know, I subscribe to the, the Arthur C. Clarke idea that um, essentially when you get to past one generation, whether it's technology or political projection, that you move into the realm of magic rather than analysis. Um, and uh, so I think I, I come at the issue of global warming within that notion of urbanization and more humans on the planet and all the costs that come with it, but it is a driver. Um, but it's an underlying effect that we can't yet determine what its impact will be on conflict, on war. But it's definitely playing out, and I think population growth, you know, essentially adding three billion more people that are consuming energy, um, it adds to it. And another part of it, if you saw that global map of where the cities were, almost all of them are not just in the developing world, they're in what we call the littoral space. They're near the coastline. And so they're going to be more vulnerable to the impacts of global warming than maybe would have, would have thought previously. To the second part of your question, that's what I put in the magic of, I don't know what happens do we hit a point where the planet literally can't support more? Is it at 12 billion? Is it at 15 billion? I, I don't know. So I, I just stay within the sort of, you know, it, it's, it's almost um, uh, crazy enough to try and say this is some of the things that will shape the next 20 years, 50, 100, you know, again, th there we're in the land of um, absolute unpredictability. Uh, but it doesn't mean, again, that the trends that are happening right now we shouldn't be attentive to. And I think population growth and all the consequences of it, particularly how it links to urbanization, are going to be major, major issues to work out. Great. Thank you. Let me thank Peter for a fascinating presentation. <laughs> Peter will be around for a few minutes if we didn't have time to get to your questions, but I want to get you out of here on time. And we hope we see you next week. Yeah.